They've won eight of their last nine games. They will play the winner of the opening round game on Tuesday in Dayton, Ohio, between Oakland University, the Golden Grizzlies out of the mid-continent, and they'll take on the Bulldogs of Alabama A&M, making their first NCAA tournament appearance. Welcome in, everybody, as we take a look back at the 2005 NCAA tournament, the Golden Grizzlies with their win over Alabama A&M. And, Coach, you know, as we look back at that 15 years ago, hey, can you believe it's been that long? No, no, but I saw a picture of it the other day, and I, I look 15 years older, I know that. <laughs> well, Coach, you know, as, as we go back and recreate that, uh, first for more of a, a 35,000-foot view, when you look back at that team, when you look back at that game, what, what's the thing that sticks out to you the most? Well, the it was called a, a first-round game or what, whatever, but it was real viewed as the play-in game. You know, at that time, there weren't four games like there are today on that Tuesday. There's one. And it was Oakland versus Alabama A&M, and the whole nation was watching. It was the only game on TV. It was, the, it was the NCAA tournament game. We got a win, so we actually have an official win in the NCAA tournament. But the whole world was watching. The place was packed. Dayton Arena was packed. And probably five or six busloads of students went to the game. And... When we came out for the start of the game, the end zone where our bench was was like the Grizz Gang here, except it was you know five times as many kids. I mean, it it was it was phenomenal. Just the feeling of knowing that you know it was such a Cinderella story, such out of nowhere. It was our third year eligible for the NCAA tournament, so it's not like you know it, it was all so new to everybody. And to walk on that court, it was, it, it, it's a feeling that's almost unexplainable. Coach, that's college basketball, right? I mean, what that did for Oakland University is, is it propelled them into the mainstream of college basketball. That's the thing you see. I mean, every single March as it rolls around. And, and you guys were a part of that. You guys have a piece of, of folklore, I guess you would say, in March Madness. Well, we're, we were the Cinderella kid. We were the story for about 10 days. And the reason we were for 10 days is because our we were at that time maybe the worst record of any team that ever made the NCAA tournament. We had an unbelievable late season run. We beat an Oral Roberts team on Pierre Duke's last second shot that changed the history of Oakland basketball. It became, I did more interviews in that 10 day period than probably my, and I do a lot of interviews. Right. And that 10-day period, I was on in Sarasota, Florida, Anchorage, Alaska, Hawaii, in Europe. People were calling and wanting, because nobody had ever heard of Oakland. They had the worst record ever. They beat a great Oral Roberts team. That Oral Roberts team was probably the best one they ever had. It was projected to be a 10 or 11 seed. That's how good they were. And, and then we go into the playing game, and we win, and now we're going to play North Carolina. So we were just the story. I mean, every day there was a story about Oakland University nationally. And it changed, it changed what college athletics meant to this campus. It changed to the administration. It, you know, Gary Rusty, our president at that time, was like, wow, he was right. You know, when he made us the move to Division I and a lot of people didn't want to do it and, and the scrutiny on our program and the national publicity that we got changed how people on this campus feel about athletics because all of a sudden basketball became important, winning became important, and this recognition changed the university. I mean, it, it just flat out changed the university. And the typical impacts those types of runs have too, enrollment spikes as well, enrollment goes up. I mean, it, it is good for business for the university, too. I mean, you, you, you put apart all that stuff, the impact it had basketball-wise. There was a business impact to Oakland as well. Well, for sure, and I think, you know, everybody knows those, the, those mid-majors that have made runs to the Final Four, what that did to them. Mm -hmm. You know, Loyola, uh, George VCU, Mason, yeah. George Mason, what that, what that impact on their enrollment and their university, it's just a, it, it's a known fact. But, for us, that was like a Final Four run because we were a Division II institution that had made the move to Division I, and nobody had ever heard of Oakland University. Most people thought it was in California, and now 
were thrust into the national spotlight. And it wasn't, you know, your 24 hours of, of fame. It was 10 days. Right. And it, it, it changed the face of our university. It changed the face of the athletics here. And it changed the face of our basketball program. There, there's no question that, you know, that one shot by Pierre absolutely changed the world for us. Camp, when you look at it too, I mean, leading up to that point where this program was, I mean, you, you had done big things before, obviously the win over Michigan. You guys have beaten Big Ten teams. You guys had big wins. For you, a guy that, that really had just about seen it all, what about for you personally when you walked out on that floor? I mean, obviously you know what's at stake and you know the media build up to it. You did all the interviews. As soon as you walked across that line onto the floor, what, what was the first thing that popped in your mind? Well, what people probably don't remember is that we were struggling. You know, we had we had bounced into Division One and won a league championship the first year, and then the year before, in two, the 2003-04 season, the year before we went to the NCAA tournament, we were picked to win the league, and we probably had, in my estimation, the most disappointing year of my all of my 42 years in this business. That 2004 team picked to win it, finished seventh, and we had. A pro, an NBA pro on that team. We had three other pros that played, you know, Kelly Williams became the face of basketball in the Philippines. Um, Still is to this day. Yes, I mean, you know, I mean, he's, Kelly Williams is the Michael Jordan of Philippine basketball, right. was a starter on that team. Uh, Raul Marshall played three years in the NBA. Mike Helms made much, made a lot of money playing professionally in Australia, was the player of the year in the Canadian Professional League. We had Jordan Sabarin, a seven-footer, who now works for the Detroit Pistons. Um, and Courtney Scott played in, in Romania for years and made a lot of money. So we had, we had this team that didn't make it. And so we were kind of reeling. And we went into the next year, and many of those kids had graduated and moved on. And we were like, wow, this, is, you know, this was our first real uh, time and my, all my time here, this was the first real year of you know danger. Will Robinson. I mean, it, it was we a were quote unquote down year. Yeah, we yeah. Well, it it was, and you know we were going into that tournament. We were nine and nine and eighteen going into the conference tournament, which we had never seen anything like that. And and to put that run together, and then you know we we really should tell the story of Pierre too because. The guy that made the shot, the, the, his story is unbelievable. But we went from, you know, danger time to the greatest time in Oakland history. Life comes at you pretty fast, doesn't it? <laughs> but, you know, let's get into the Pierre Dukes thing because we'll do that as well. I mean, take a look at, at some of the characters of this team, the, the individual makeup of this basketball team. Start with Pierre Dukes. I mean, this is a guy, there were times of that season you didn't think he was going to be on that court for you or in the program at all. Well, he wasn't in the program. After the, that disappointing 2000, he was a young player on that team and he didn't get to play. And Pierre didn't have a lot of confidence in himself. And he came in to me after the season, you know, and that was a very disappointing year. It ended with a loss to Valpo uh, in the tournament. We'd never, you know, we'd never beaten Valpo. It was, it was hard times around here. And Pierre said to me, Coach, I, I don't want to do this anymore. Um, and he was willing to give up his scholarship and just be a student. And I said, okay, Pierre, because I didn't think he could play anyway. So, right, right. Um, you know, it was, that's fine. So then we go into the off season and I have openings on the floor, on the team because like I said, it was, you know, we had lost a bunch of guys. The, that team didn't like each other. I'd never experienced that as a coach before. They liked each other off the floor, but on the floor they didn't like playing with each other. There were some personality conflicts. I'd never gone through that in coaching, and it was a disaster. So in the summer, we, had, we went through our summer basketball, and when fall got here, we didn't have, our, our roster was not full. And I called Pierre on the phone when school started. I said, hey, Pierre, how about we do this? How about I give you your scholarship back and all you have to do is practice with us. Because I knew the, 
the games and not playing and not had really worn on him personally. The fact that he had gone from this high school star to not being able to play, he was really struggling with that emotionally. I said, you don't play any games. Nobody will even know it. I just need bodies. And, you know, you're a good enough player to help us in practice. And I'll give, because I had two or three scholarships I wasn't using. I go, I'll give you your scholarship back. So he said, okay. So the first two, three weeks of practice, you know, he was the same old Pierre, but then when he wasn't getting yelled at, when he wasn't, there was no pressure on him, he started practicing really well. And we scrimmaged a, a, a full team scrimmage before the first exhibition game, and he, he was one of the better players. So I said to him afterwards, goes, hey, you sure you don't want to try playing in the games? And he was like, well, you know, he wasn't sure. And he finally decided you know, he has to do it, but you know, coach, I don't want to, I don't want the pressure of being a starter. You know, I'll, I'll play if I can help you. You can put me in. So the year went on, and by the end of the year, he's playing. You know, and he's Oral Roberts, Raul Marshall's got the ball, three seconds to go in the game. We're down two, and Raul's Raul gets in a position where he really can't shoot it. And I give Raul all the credit in the world. This is an NBA player who had a chance to shoot the ball to win the game or tie the game, because I think he was inside the three-point line. And he gave the ball up at the last second to Pierre Dukes, who wasn't even on the team when the season started. And he buries a three. The place goes nuts, and the life of Oakland University athletics changes. Oakland down two. Pierre Dukes call it a three from the corner. Yes! With 1.3. You know, Coach, when, when you look at it too, it's interesting. You, you talk about Rawl being in that spot and a guy that wasn't even on the team. Well, two guys that were on the team most decidedly and ultimately ended up being pros. When you look at Rawl Marshall, you look at Courtney Scott, the game in particular against Alabama A&M really spelled out the impact that they had. I think they combined for 50 points, 17 rebounds. Uh, when I look back at the box score of that game, that's a typical Coach Campy box score, right? There's six or seven guys that scored in total, but Rawl and Courtney had 50 points. Your shooter, Brandon Cassisi, off the bench had 13. Uh, that was that, that was a vintage Oakland basketball performance, wasn't it? And one of the greatest dunks Oakland's ever seen. I said to Bob today, you're either the most popular guy in college basketball or the most hated guy in college basketball. Depends on who you're talking to. Oh. Whoa! How about Raul Marshall? Raul taking it to the rack. Raw. Talk about his athleticism once again. Two steps into the lane in elevation. And nobody steps up to help. And you just can't give him a launch pad because he will take off. Tremendous elevation. The fact that dunk, because it was in the NCAA tournament, got Raul. They put Raul in the, in the dunk contest at the end of the year. You know how they have the three-point shooting contest and the dunk contest? That dunk got Raul in it. And Raul wasn't a dunker. I mean, it, the the two or three weeks before the dunk contest he's in here trying to figure out what he's going to do because he's never been a dunker but he, he the emotion and the adrenaline of that day that dunk he had down the middle was as good a dunk as you'll ever see if if I, i'm pretty sure it was the number one play on espn and all that kind of stuff but yeah that was a you know we we really kind of walked the dog on on the Alabama A&M that night. We, we, we were playing with such a high level of confidence and with such great emotion. And, and to walk onto that court and see all those people and know that people had driven down. I'll tell you a real funny story about that. Uh, this, uh, you know, the NSA tournament was new to me. I, I had been there as an assistant coach, you know, uh, 20 years before that or whatever. Um, but one of the local TV stations, you know, I always say yes to the, to the media. One of the local TV stations before the playing game wanted to do a remote interview with me. And the game was a seven o'clock game and they were doing what, the 620 news, the sports at 620 and would I go live for them? And I, I'm thinking, you know, I'll do anything for anybody. So yeah, I'll do it. So they, they come and get me and it's outside. <laughs> they, they were doing it because it's March, it's nice out. Yeah. They were doing it outside UD Arena at 620. I went out and did that because it was a live thing. Yeah. I couldn't get back in the building. 
It was unbelievable. I couldn't well, they didn't get know back. who you were, right? No, no one knew who I was. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had a suit and tie. I know. If I'd have been dressed like I'm dressed today for games, I never would have gotten back in. But I had a suit and tie, and I had my little NCA pin on for the thing, you know. And uh, I also had a Nike pin on yeah. because at that time, back in the day, we had just gotten with Nike, and and we had always been a Reebok school. But Ron Marshall wanted Nike so bad, and so I we moved over to Nike. And I was wearing the little Nike swoosh, and I had the little NSA tournament thing on, and I finally found a side door where they let me in, and they took me down. The team was sitting in the locker room waiting for me. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was so... Never, it, was on, it was on brand, right? Well, like, it was never yeah. having been there before, yeah. you know, it was, and I hadn't been, and it was exciting. And so, so I get in, I talk, and like at the first or second media timeout during the game, uh, I'm going out of the timeout, I'm going to sit down, and somebody comes up behind the bench and goes like this and taps me on the shoulder and says, you have to take the Nike swoosh off. This is the NCAA tournament, and we're not allowed to have advertising. So I got scolded by the, N the NCAA. I almost wasn't even allowed back in the arena. <laughs> it, <laughs> it, was, it was quite a game. <laughs> but, you know... It as as I've talked to, to these to these guys, if I've, as I've talked to Raul Marshall, as I've talked to Courtney Scott, there's like a certain smile that comes on their face anytime that, and, and you're getting it right now too. You don't even know it, but you're getting it right now too. And Courtney Scott in particular ha, has always told me the feeling we had, and you referenced it a little bit ago, the momentum that you guys were playing with, there was no way you were going to lose that game on that day. Because when you, when you go back and you look at it, Alabama A&M didn't play bad. They shot the ball fairly well. I mean, but you, but as you talked about, I mean, you guys you guys just steamrolled. You were playing with such confidence. I mean, could you guys have been maybe the greatest 13 and 18 team and the 13 and 19 team in the history of college basketball? We were pretty good, and yeah. the, we opened the North Carolina game pretty good. And I mean, they were they won the national championship, right. and it was just a matter of time. But if we had played to the level we played at the end of the year all year, we would have been a 12-13 seed and maybe won a couple games. You know, maybe got that 12-5 win or whatever. Um, but we, I mean, you, we had an NBA player on that team in Raul Marshall. Right. Courtney Scott was close to being an NBA right. player. Now, the, the rest of the pieces, um, great kids and, and good bat, Pierre Dukes, and that, you know, some, or mid, mid continent level basketball players, not, you know, no better than that. Because, um, see, see, we had a good freshman class that, you know, if they had been sophomores or juniors, maybe that would have added it too. Uh, Carson and McCluskey and uh, uh, Cassisi, those three guys. And Demarcus Ishmael, our point guard, was, you know, a little five foot one or whatever the heck he was. Um, so, but that team was really playing good and really confident. But, you know, uh, <laughs> there were some guys on that team that were the carryover from the year before that didn't care a great deal about each other easy either and it took some time you know there were a lot of things underlying behind it that had carried over from the year before that it was like I said it was a dark time in all my years of coaching you know the behind the scene things it, it was not pretty and and this team grew as men and grew up and at the end of it you know I'll never forget uh, we cut the nets down after we beat Oral Roberts. And, you know, all the media stuff. As soon as the game ended, I'm doing a ESPN because they had done the game live. The players are cutting the nets down. They're, introduced, they're announcing this. And then at the end, you have to go to the media room. And so in the back hallways of the building, we're walking to the media room. And up ahead of me, Courtney Scott and Raul Marshall are walking, and they stop. And they don't know I see this. I'm 30 yards behind. They stop and they hug each other. And those two guys didn't really like each other. Now, these two guys are walking, you know, a month later, they're walking down the hall, unprompted, don't know anybody's around, and they stop and they hug each other. And they've been friends for life since, yep. you know, close friends for life since. And that's what athletics does. That's, that's what winning does too, but that's, that's an athletic story. So, Coach, the lead into that game against Alabama and of course, the, the, the shot that set the program to a whole other level here at Oakland. Uh, Pierre Dukes makes that shot. You guys get the win. You're headed to Dayton to play Alabama A&M. What was that next 24 hours like for you for Oakland University? 
You know, it was unbelievable. So I just told the story about them hugging. They go to the press conference. We get back and we go to the hotel. And I get to the hotel and we're going up to eat our post-game meal. And all our fans, we had invited all the fans over to the hotel too. So, you know, there's a core of fans at Oakland. Right. They're still here. Right. But, you know, the, the, the pep band, the uh, cheerleaders and all those, we invited them all up to the meal. And we just ordered chicken wings and had food coming in. And it was the happiest moment. So people were so happy. You know, there's 200 people in this room. And I get a tap on the shoulder. WJR wants to talk to you. Who? WJR, WJR even knows we exist, you know. So I went and I did that, and then all night long, I was up the whole night, three o'clock in the morning. I'm talking to, you know, ESPN Radio in Oregon and things like that. So that we get and we we fly home, and when we get home, we get to the airport or we get into the terminal and we're walking, and. We get to where you go to baggage claim, and there is a, uh, what are those things they pull across the, you know, a guard that you can't yeah, get by, a barrier. Yeah. a barrier. And we come walking up to the barrier, and there had to be every TV station camera. I mean, it was like a presidential, uh, you know, news conference. There were 20 deep cameras, media, pictures being taken, and our players came around the corner and saw that. And the look in their eye, I've got a picture, somebody took a picture of it and it's an unbelievable picture, but the look in their eyes and they're stopping, they're on TV, they're talking and I mean it was, Oakland had never experienced anything like that. These kids had never experienced anything like that and they're in the airport and all the people in the airport are coming around, you know, the people that don't even know who we are that are getting on a flight are coming to see what's going on. It's like the Beatles. And it, it, was, yeah. it, was, uh, it was just an unbelievable experience, probably something those kids for the rest of their lives will be telling their kids about and everything it was it was so so surreal i guess is the right word and and that whole trip neil that whole trip um when we when we flew to tulsa for the tournament they lost our bags they didn't lose them what happened is that was back in the golf golf war was going on 2005 and there were military people on the plane so they took all the bags off and so that the military people's bags could get on it because we were taking care of the veterans and all that right. kind of stuff. And so we get there and our bags aren't there. Well, the next day at shoot around, we have no bags. We have no uniforms. We have no shoes. So we're waiting. They're saying they're going to get us to us. We talked to Oral Roberts. They were going to let us wear their road uniform. Um, and then I, was, I had sent our graduate assistant to the uh, mall and he was trying to find a pair of basketball shoes for every guy on our team. He had the size of everybody. And this, this is all going on, you know, the old bucket theory that, you know, all, everything that can go bad is going bad. And we end up going and with, despite all those distractions, we win the thing. So, I mean, it, it, it was just... It, it, when you have a smile on my face, it's because as you think more about it and the more memories that come, it, it was the most off-the-wall, unusual thing that could possibly ever happen.